All right, well, thank you very much. Hey, I could, uh, I see why you chose me as a segue from the Well Driller Convention you know, guys, and, and I know all of them very well. I've been, worked with them on committees and so on, and have been very active in the NGWA. Uh, I don't know if I uh, predate any of them by any uh, degree or not, but I start all my McElhenney lectures that I'm doing this year, by the way, I'm, you know, the one running around the country. I think it's about my 16th state uh, presentation so far this year. But I start each one of them by saying that the first well that I observed being drilled was in 1950, and it was a private water well being drilled for me and my siblings. My mom and dad were having a water well drilled, and I remember that as far back as then. We lived on that well. I've been a big advocate and a lifetime user of private water wells, so I am all about private water wells. And I've been a scientist and a contractor, but I'm now really specializing in outreach and education and communicating with people. I love that word, Jeff. Um, and I've done a fair amount of that in, over the years with the uh, writings I've done for the Waterville Journal, maybe over 60, 70 articles at least, uh, countless presentations. Uh, I work a lot with the cooperative extension groups at the University of Arizona, and uh, we have a program where we go around. I have six of them yet to do this year to uh, each county and give free three-hour private water well classes to the people, and they come in by the dozens, 50 and 60 people at a time. I've also outreached in my career to the well drillers and pump installers, and to that question about how do you get the information to or from uh, the well drillers' hands about things that need to be done, my answer is write an article, get it published in their trade magazine, or go to Groundwater Week in December and make a presentation and, and make it. You can reach hundreds of them at, at one time. I found that to be a very effective way to do it. But in, in this presentation that I want to talk about today, I've taken one aspect of outreach and education to a particular market because in my area and many of the western states, there are um, states that do not have anyone inspecting, testing, or monitoring, certifying um, private water wells. Um, they simply don't regulate them at, at all. It just seems like everything is being done for the commercial side or the public side and maybe even a little bit on agriculture. But the, the thing that I'm talking about is the inspections that people do uh, for the um, transfer and sale and purchase of real property. I know there's a lot of rules and regulations that go into the time that the well is drilled and constructed and that sort of thing for the first unique owner of the well. But after that, who gives a darn about when the well is resold, except for a few states like New Jersey, New York, and so on. And I really would like to work with some of those people, or at least talk to them, get their cards, and so on, as to how I could get my state a little more uh, active in taking, looking at uh, private water wells and the sampling testing that's required you know we know as groundwater scientists that it takes a little bit of knowledge and skill to take a proper well sample and even knowing where to take the sample are you going to take it at the wellhead the source are you going to take it at the point of entry or the point of use i'll come back and, and mention all those things again in just a little bit but that's just some of the questions that we have and in a situation like mine the state of arizona there are absolutely no standards for any of this this is for the time of the transfer and sale of real estate, and very little, even when they're new. So let me explain a little bit about that. This leaves, to me, the buyers of homes on private water well systems, and it doesn't matter if it's a single wide out in the desert or a five-acre, five million dollar horse property in Scottsdale, Arizona. They all deserve the same uh, consideration, but the homeowners are per actually very unprotected, and yet, uh, we homes are inspected, must be inspected by law in our state. You have to have the home inspected by a licensed certified inspector, and they have to have continuing education. You have The seller has to have the septic tank pumped and demonstrate to the buyer that there's a good septic tank on the property. That employee and driving around that vacuum truck is... Um, a certified individual with a license in our state and required to have continuing education, as are the pest inspectors. We call them termite inspectors most often because that's our biggest pest. But those people have to be licensed, certified, and trained in everything. But why not water well inspectors? I mean, I've, I say this a lot of time to my classes. You can live in a home with a leaky roof. In my area, it only rains six inches a year, so we don't 
worry too much about a hole in the roof. But, uh, and you know, you can live in a place where the septic tank is a little slow to work in such times, and you can live in a home with termites. As a matter of fact, I really think I've lived in a home with all three of them <laughs> simultaneously. But you can't live in one without water. So why don't more states recognize the importance of water from private water wells? There's other aspects of that. Oops, I'm going backwards. Other aspects of that, that I could uh, talk about too, but got to keep us going here. So why would we even bother to inspect and sample private water wells at the time of sale anyway? Well, for me, it's uh, natural. It's the due diligence by the buyer or in a few states, in a few areas, there's a lender requirements or there are state codes and regulations. Now, sometimes I, I've let, done some research and looked at the codes that New Jersey and New York and Wisconsin, I think Oregon has some others and some that have some of these codes for the sale of real estate. And I really think it, that they're necessary. And I think you'll see why I'm saying that in just a little minute. But the other thing is, and what drives the necessity for codes to do it, why legislators can justify doing this, is for the protection of the health, safety, and welfare of the public. That's why so many rules and regulations regarding things of this type are put in place. So in a state that doesn't license inspectors and so on, um, there is another way, and I worked hard on this one. I worked with the Real Estate Association. As I said, we have no regs, no requirements during the sale and transfer for people on private water wells. And they had a form out there that the uh, Associ Arizona Association of Realtors was using, and they called for a certified well inspection, you know, kind of written in hard, in, I, and I told them we have to get that word out of the regulations. And so for a year and a half, I worked with them on committees and going to those meetings like other people have talked about. And we finally got it boiled down to this. It says that if water well performance or water quality is a material matter to the buyer, the buyer shall inspect the well, request that a, what I thought was going to be defined and, and uh, made a person or an entity, well inspector to send a water sample uh, to a qualified laboratory to determine the acceptability for the buyer's use and need, and that's why we, so we put the burden, if we couldn't get it through legislation, we put it on, on the buyer to take care of this. Now, the other part of that um, code is when in 19, uh, 2012, February 2012, it took effect. Um, if the well inspector shall verify the well's gallons per minute, that's sort of the, the way I could get that part across, and the pumping rate, but the other thing that I wanted to do was get in there the recharge weight rate <clears throat> during the inspection. And I'll come back to that in a little bit as to why I wanted that in there. And then if applicable, uh, the buyer shall tell uh, the lender that if they have any requirements, oh, by the way, tell us what your requirements are early on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as I said, uh, I would get these questions all the time to say, I need a well cert. What is that, you know, or I need, you know, just the thing that everybody does. Well, there isn't a thing that everybody does because there weren't any standards for doing it. So I got that worked out and I started looking back at what does the word certify mean? And, and I take this from uh, some dictionaries, but basically it's a confirmation of something that's true and exact. You know, like think of it you know, one way is as a uh, certified birth certificate. It tells someone that this is a real and genuine copy of what that was, and it's genuine. There's other things about it, such as um, the certification for an EPA-certified lab. What we know is that that laboratory's procedures and their methods and their equipment have been used and inspected, so that's sort of a procedure certification that they have. Then the other thing that I kept seeing about the word certainty and certify and all that is that it, it comes with kind of an implied warranty of assurance. It's sort of a form of a warranty because if you think about this, um, that um, a, uh, a certified cashier's check is warranting that that money is there and that it's good. And, and that's kind of one way of thinking of it as a warranty. And, there's, and I bring, I'll bring that into why it bothers me. And then the rest of it is um, having to pay, um, uh, having a, an agency or a state association certified to the qualifications of the person that is doing the thing. But remember, now I'm a certified well driller, pump installer, I'm a certified professional geologist, I was a certified real estate instructor, but 
uh, all of those basically are peer endorsements, peer endorsements. They are not a licensure. There's a big difference there between certification, and I really am proud of my certified well driller pump installer because it's the one well the, the, um, that requires uh, continuing education because it doesn't do anything to ha get a certification and then not have to keep it up to date. So if you think of it, you know, like a certified flight instructor, that's somebody, that's a form of licensure, CPAs, those are basically, uh, their, their trade association has turned that into licensure now. Most of the states uh, accept that. But be careful of uh, how you use that word, and I'll come back to that. But when I think about uh, using the word certification as a, a certified well inspector or something like that, and, and you think about how would you structure the licensing, and that's why I want to talk to some of the other states, is it the person that's doing the inspection that you certify them, that they are the one that is certified so anything that they do makes it good, or is it the procedure of the test and the inspections and the measurements that they take that they do that according to a certified a standard that has been approved and accepted and constantly modified, like a certified uh, testing laboratory? Or should it be the results, the final product, if it's a report that goes to the buyer, is it saying that, okay, this report tells you that you've got what you've got, and this is good for you, and it's going to be good for you. Those are just some of the questions that I ask myself when trying to figure out how would we go about doing this anyway if I could get it through. So if it was the person that was going to be doing the certification or be certified, who would do it? Would it be the uh, Department of Environmental Quality because they have the quality, or would it be the Department of Natural Resources or Water Resources or, you know, the people that can manage and control the groundwater? Possibly one of them should do it. Or here's a couple of associations, the NGWA and the AIPG. They could certify, uh, develop a certified program. I wouldn't mind if the NGWA... Uh, would develop a certified well inspection program to go along with all the others they have. It seems to me it would be unnatural, but it would still be a peer endorsement. It's not licensure unless the states decide to accept it. Now, I'm a registered professional geologist in the state of Arizona. That's my stamp down there. And I went to that board, which we call the State Board of Technical Registration. They're the ones that um, provide C. Uh, you know, professional engineers, registered geologists, and, and all the other trades that they do. Many trades, you wouldn't be, you'd be surprised at the trades that they do that are far less uh, impact on the public than testing the water, inspecting the well. So I went to their board meeting and said, hey, I want you guys to start uh, a program to license and certify a well inspector. And they said, well, Gary, that's not the way it works. First of all, you got to go to a state legislative or senator person, get them to write a bill, and then you'll get it to pass through the House, pass through the Senate, and signed by the governor. I said, oh, yeah, well, I, you know, that's going to happen. You know, I need a, a disaster to bring that to their attention. So I figured that's not going to be the way I'm going to go very far with that. But um, back to the other process of asking ourselves, and this is why I want to know what some of the other states went through, in certifying uh, uh, licensing inspectors of wells. Now, and I'm talking about for the sale and transfer of real estate, not, not the kind of inspection that a contractor does for his customer, not the kind of assessment that uh, other people do, you know, in your program, that sort of thing, but something that is for the buyer. Because you're, when you're doing this work for a buyer, that is not contracting. Contracting is a permanent improvement to real property. A service call is a service call to the existing owner of the property. When you do an inspection for a prospective buyer, you're consulting. And maybe it's because I'm a registered geologist that I think this is the way that it needs to be looked at, is that it is a consulting trade that you are doing. But um, back to the way other uh, industries do that. The uh, uh, Association of um, American uh, International Association of Home Inspectors, they have a standard procedure that they follow, and they have specified things that, that, they, that they do. That's how they looked at it. Laboratories use the system of being inspected and following standards set by the federal government. And I said, the home inspectors are uh, licensed and certified in our state, but, and as are the other ones, but, but uh, not, not well. Uh, not well inspectors, but the home inspections uh, must be certified, but they don't inspect water wells, 
and they don't look at the water treatment equipment, and uh, they don't often collect the sample and put it on ice and run it to the lab the way you know a licensed or certified water sampler would do. And uh, one more thing. Now, water well drillers, pump installers are typically the people now that are doing that service in, in my state because you have to have been a pump installer or at least trained in these new systems that are out there. Some of them are pretty sophisticated. And if you're going to go out and do an inspection on it, troubleshoot it, and then try and write up a report to tell the buyer what they're getting for their you know, $500,000 sale or whatever in their dream home, uh, you, you've got to know what you're talking about. So I don't see any other way for them to do it. But what concerns me about having private contractors do this, and, and I have admit, when I was a contractor, I also did well inspections. But remember, I have a license to consult, and I had E&O insurance. What I tell the well drillers all the time, and I did a workshop, I think maybe three or four years ago at, at National, was that water well contractors, if you're out there doing well inspections, you're consulting, you're, you could be consulting, and it would only take one slip of the tongue or one slip of the word to get you into trouble because your general liability insurance does not cover you for errors and emissions. So it's a serious problem for them, and I try to warn them about it from time to time. Now, on the aspect of looking at uh, certifying a well for, to make it adequate for a person, I threw out some questions or some ideas here. Uh, what is an adequate amount of water for a home? Somebody said yesterday, or earlier this morning, it was they couldn't live on a gallon and a half. But I know people that have half a gallon a minute wells, and they, they and their three children and two dogs and maybe a, a goat or two uh, somehow manage to get by on a half a gallon a minute. But <laughs> it's, it's not easy. Um, but is three gallons a minute enough? Uh, would a four-hour test of that um, be adequate to prove that the well is good? How about this one? Uh, I, when I worked for the water utility, uh, we were trying to beat the peak at 150 gallons per person per day, and now that's getting downwards to below 100 gallons per per day. But that's something you, you can't use as saying it's adequate because it varies whether you're in, you know, Seattle, Washington, or uh, yeah, Seattle, Washington, or, or uh, uh, Fort Mojave, Arizona. You know, uh, there's a it's a it's a different number, and and we know that uh, the majority, or I think it's two thirds of the water that people use off private well system goes for outdoor use anyway. It's far less indoor than it does outdoor, so you can't really relate that to per capita per day uh, unless you have the monitoring data. Sufficient for all domestic purposes. I'll come back to that one in a minute. Who said that one? Or who has written that one? Sufficient for just the life of the loan. I want to talk about that in a minute too. About um, the way some of the reason for some of these inspections are being done is for lenders. And then there's this hundred-year assured or adequate water supply. In my state, we have two different uh, boundaries of um, water management. If you're in one area and you're on a public system, you have a 100-year assured water supply if that provider is connected to the CAP canal that's bringing surface water in, you know, half clear across the state. But if you're in a big subdivision development in the outlying counties, Cochise County is one of them and some other places, and you put in 150, or as just recently there was some legislation about a 7,600 uh, home subdivision that was going in, and they were having to show that they had 100 years of adequate water supply for every person that bought a home on that public system. But the little people next door on the five-acre lot with a few horses or a one-acre lot, they have nothing. It, the, the disparity between what people on other systems have in the way of warranty of their water supply, which I think is probably just as important as quantity and quality. You know, is, what they have is nothing, okay? Uh, so should a report certify that the well is adequate for the buyers? This is a rhetorical question in the lender's current use, or, you know, should the report include a statement regarding the future um, uh, owner's water supply, you know, in, in, uh, in perpetuity down the road. So those are things just that I thought about when talking about the, the complexity of this subject. So just how, and we talk about the quantity, this is about how good should the water be. Underwriters often send me a statement that says, well, just test the water in the well to make sure that it's safe and potable. 
I wrote an article not too long ago saying, well, what test determines whether water is safe and potable? Is it the new source supply standards, every single thing that, that you can test for currently, you know, currently on, on the list? Or where do I take the sample? The lenders will never tell me, oh, well, take it right at the wellhead or take it pre or post treatment or uh, at the point of entry or at the point of use and all that sort of stuff. And, and I wonder sometimes too that uh, if they had standards that we were trying to meet, what would happen uh, if, if it was just one part per billion or in, the, in PFAS is in terminology, one part per trillion, you know, greater than uh, the, the limit that they set, would that be a, a reason to deny uh, them a, a loan? So those issues about point of entry, raw water, post water treatment, drinking water only are for the outside. You know, there's a lot of people that have private water wells simply for their irrigation and supply and they don't have it, you know, they have the, uh, we call it conjunctive use. They may have the municipal system for the home, but they'll use the, the water well for all the irrigation. Frankly, I just turned it around backwards. I do <laughs> Now you can't afford the public supply for irrigation, but I, I don't like the chlorinated water in most of those cases. Anyway, so under, I believe, and I've written about this, underwriters have created a lot of confusion about this inspecting process that, you know, I used to do day in and day out. They would have words in there like sufficient for all domestic purposes. Um, that was a loan standard or safe and potable as called for by uh, the lenders and, and the underwriters. And I'm, I don't want to pick on mortgage lenders and so on because what I did as a contractor in order to get all this work for doing home, home inspections was I became a member of the local real estate association. I became an associate member of the local mortgage lending association. And I went to their lunches and you know once a month and, and shook hands and met the people. And that's how I can, you can develop uh, additional business. But what I found out, and this is where it really starts to get a little sticky and I hope I'm not stepping on anyone's toes here today, but I, I can't help it. This is fact. I took this off the internet here. And it was an update. You can see it's from a VA pamphlet, 26-7, chapter 12, uh, March 28, 2019. Well, it reads, if I can see that from here, that all testing must be performed by a disinterested third party. By the way, this is a new and revised version from what we had and uh, what I often uh, t spoke about before. This includes collecting and transporting the water sample from the water supply source, that, that's an improvement, and then the sample must be collected and tested by the local health authority. Now that's where it breaks down a little bit. And a commercial testing laboratory or a licensed water treatment plant engineer, <laughs> not a sanitary engineer, or another party that is acceptable to the health authority you know, can collect that sample. They go back to that local health authority. And then the rest of that reads is that if water quality from an individual water supply must meet the requirements of the health authority having jurisdiction. I don't have a health authority that has any jurisdiction in my state and many other states do not too. So if the local authority does not have specific requirements, the guidelines established by the EPA will apply. That sounds like a pretty good way to do it, but they didn't accept any things from the EPA standards. So here's the list that many of you I'm sure are familiar with. They have a lot of MCLs on that list and includes a wide you know, number of different categories for water quality testing, don't they? And they didn't accept any of these and they didn't say all of them. But you and I uh, probably know how much these uh, different uh, tests cost. Here's some price numbers for me. I can get uh, E. coli for $50 for the first one. This is sell price, by the way, not, not my price. I get a deal. Uh, $50 for the first one, $45 for the second one, and then primary and secondary, about $400 for uh, those two combined. But if I do the new source supply well and meet all those things, it's $3,800, $4,000, you know. And to me, the literal interpretation of that wording is that since I don't have a standard to meet, this is what I got to do. So I go back to the, to the, I usually have to go back to the realtor. The realtor says, well, I don't know what to say. I've never run into this before. So they say, well, why don't you talk to the lender? So I call the lender. The lender says, I don't know what to do. You got to talk to my underwriter. That's where it usually breaks down because you can talk to a lender, underwriter in Atlanta or one in Los Angeles or one in New Jersey or somewhere and they all have a slightly different, you know, explanation. What the, you know what they say? Well, $4,000? We can't do that. 
I'll just do the cola form. That'll be good enough. <laughs> Okay, five minutes more. I say, so yeah, how do you want, uh, how safe do you want one of them to be? Uh, well, that's a question that we can go through and look like that red line down there is the radionuclides and so on, uh, viruses. Everything below that line is the things that the EPA is likely to put onto us in the very near future. So who sets the water quality standards? Well, EPA for the public, state and local authorities in a few states, mortgage lenders and that from the other ones in, in many of the other states. But so I say if the lenders are doing that, then they have to be the ones to tell us, you know, what the standard is and how are we going to meet it. Now, the VA pamphlet um, for shared wells. Not every uh, state, you know, allows that. I guess I don't. I, I've been trying to learn all these who who does and who doesn't. But we certainly have a bunch of them in my state. This is the wording: A shared water well must be capable of providing a continuing supply, safe and potable water, to each property simultaneously, so that each dwelling will be assured a sufficient quantity of water for all domestic purposes. I have no idea what all domestic purposes is, but I've underlined some of the words that I really don't like in there. Continuing is a, is a word of warranty, future uh, supply, safe and potable. Uh, I don't know what test it would take uh, to determine that. But to serve each property simultaneously, now that has a, adds a whole lot more work to what I gotta do to make sure that uh, I don't know how to determine that mechanically or just go around and turn on the faucets in all 16 shared wells at the same time and see how it performs. I mean, you could take a literal interpretation of that. But they want it to be assured, and that's a warranty word, for a sufficient quantity for all domestic purposes. So if any of you well drillers are out there are doing well inspection reports and signing off of it and say, I hereby certify that this property has this well and this is the way it does it, or this shared well does all these things. Oh boy, I, <laughs> I worry for you, you know, if something should go wrong, because I think they imply uh, a warranty of a future performance. And uh, private well owners are certainly not being protected as well as other buyers and so on. We have to do something about protecting the health, safety, and welfare of homeowners equal to what they get when you buy a, um, a, an existing home. But where is the answer to it? You know, well, like I'm uh, parroting what other people have said here, we need communication uh, with everyone involved, all the realtors, mortgage lenders, underwriters, state and federal, federal regulators, local regulators, if there were some, and water well inspectors or the water well industry, all of us together, you know, to try and figure out, you know, how we're gonna do this situation. So I really appreciate the opportunity to throw this out there to all of you and so on. I just wanna very quickly add an additional method of outreach that um, I've been able to, to add to, uh, to the uh, record of things and, and my my way of doing it with people asking these questions you know I could have answered in the other in the other session one is through cooperative extension I've worked with a lot of them uh, I think that's a good person to cooperate with and write articles and bulletins that are because be they target the private well community you know the 4-h and the uh, master gardener and all those things I reached out to them we've uh, co-authored a, a book here with some people in my state uh, to reach out to the real estate and mortgage lending communities, I wrote an ebook specifically designed for, uh, it's a guide to realtors and mortgage lenders. Um, they, 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 for that. And then, you know, out of time? Okay, I'll leave it right there. Thank you all very much. I appreciate this. We can share this one. <laughs> Just real close. That's crazy. No, not here. <laughs> okay, so um, we're, there's a couple questions here. Um, do you believe that a one-time inspection of water, a water test proves the best representation of a water system to, for the buyer? Um, it, it is an indication to the buyer of what it is at this point in time, so, but we always recommend that wells should be tested at least once a year, for the, or twice a year maybe for the coliform. Anytime there's a change or a break into the system or do any work on the well or anything like that, shock it and test it again. And then other things like arsenic once every five years, uh, some of the others, you know, uh, biannually, something like that. So it, it's a variable. Yeah. So and uh, the other two questions here, and we're going to go to break so we can get back in time. If you want to talk to Gary about his articles, you can come talk to him. He'll be here the whole week. Yep. Uh, thank you again. Oh, all right. All right. Thank you all.